Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right? All right. Enjoy. Welcome to another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. I know we want to get into the action, but I have to ask that you help me armor us up a bit for the bumpy road ahead. Because I bring you the first hour of this show without unrelated ad nonsense as a proof of concept. And if you value it, then come over to THC Plus for the $8 a month and hear the full two-hour interviews as they were designed to be and as you would enjoy them most. Go to thehiresidechats.com or just click the link in the show notes to get started and within a minute you'll be plugging in your new Plus Show RSS feed into a hopefully decentralized podcasting 2.0 supported app. Feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go and we will reach the promised land. Think about that and enjoy the show. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, Higher Side Chatters. Doing the thing from sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood. And anyone who's got even the most basic understanding of history knows that empires and the indigenous people in the way of their expansion efforts do not mix well. Oftentimes a people who don't speak the language or even understand the mindset of the hostile invader stand little chance as they're intentionally infected with disease, steamrolled with new policies and procedures, pushed to the margins of their ancestral lands, and systematically abused in ways that are hard to even talk about. Today, it's commonly held wishful thinking to assume the high-level benefactors of empire and the archon-controlled predator class no longer employ these tactics or operate from such a mindset. Yet we are in the midst of a global injection campaign, a dismantling of medical autonomy, cultural segregation, and movement management based on our compliance to the Empire's experts, so it doesn't seem all that different to me. And probably not to today's guest Darren Grimes either. We all know Darren is one half of the Canadian podcasting powerhouse that is Gramerica, but he's also just finished writing his first book entitled A Canadian Shame, The Indian Act and Residential Schools. It's a much-needed look at how the native people of Canada were treated by the invaders and how the multi-generational effects of this darkness are still felt today. And given the recent uncovering of several mass graves near these old residential schools, the timing couldn't be better. Happy to have him here to talk about it, my Canadian podcasting colleague of the North and freshly minted author extraordinaire, Darren, my man, welcome back. Hey, Greg, thanks for having me. Always good to be back on the higher side. Yes, this is awesome. Congrats on getting the book done. Not an easy thing to do. When I saw the title, A Canadian Shame, I thought, oh, I guess he wrote a book about his co-host, Graham. I thought about <laughs> it. I mean, I promised Graham I wouldn't pick on him too much during this interview, but we got to pick on him a little bit. I mean, he just found out he used to be a super soldier and oh, uh, was on the Mars 20 and back or whatever. I mean, this is he's got a lot of that on his plate right now. He's just found out this week, so he's dealing oh. with that. 
That is a lot to process, but Corey Good, I'm sure, can help him go through the motions and get his life back together. He's probably 150 years old now with all the regression that happens. Thoughts and prayers, for sure. <laughs> That's all we can do. Maybe we'll change our uh, Twitter avatars for him for a couple of days. Amen. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I kid, I kid. I love Graham, but... Uh, let me just ask you how things are in general. Canada is one of those countries where it seems like the COVID policies are on the harsher side, but I did hear you say somewhere that you're really not that concerned because Canada is so spread out that they really don't have the manpower to enforce the things that they might want to. And I thought that was a pretty good point, but how are you guys holding up these days and dealing with all the craziness? Man, Alberta, it seemed like, and I don't know if it was by design or not, but it seems like, I mean, our premier's a doofus. I really have a hard time believing that he's part of some, any sort of cabal. And we were like almost out of it. We were almost out of it. We had this date set for, I think it was August 16th or something like that. No, it was like August 23rd and everything was going to be over. The only way to get a test after that, which I think is the biggest thing of all. They were going to change it. So instead of being able to just go through this drive through testing thing, which now is still here, but they had said this was all going to end as of August 23rd. If you want a COVID test, you're going to need to go get a prescription. So you either got to call your doctor, get a prescription, or if you don't want to do that, you have to go to the hospital, which I think just those couple of barriers to entry right there would probably have cut everything back by probably like 80 to 90%. And then along with that, we were ending all quarantine requirements. Now, I haven't looked into it because I don't live in Saskatchewan, but they had said the same thing. And I don't know if they've stuck with it or not, but basically the health authorities, authorities, I even hate saying that, but had come out and said, you know, it's time to start treating this as endemic instead of pandemic and it's time to just let adults make adult decisions and people make you know when you're sick don't go to school you don't need a test to say that when you're sick don't go to work when you're sick don't go to school don't go to walmart don't go out to the restaurant all that stuff don't do that shit when you're sick which i mean maybe some of us got lazy on that maybe this has been a little bit of a reminder of that but i mean here's the thing that really i think hits at home is canada had enough money to give everyone some cash and I get to finish that thought because we are far from out of this. They ended up extending that till September sometime. It was supposed to be September 16th. There's a news conference today that I, I missed. It's probably still going on right now. He was already screaming at unvaccinated people saying we're the worst. And he started offering to pay people $100 a shot to go get the shot. So I think we're the first people to actually offer cold, hard cash to just go get your shots. Right. Outside of the lottery system that we've had a million dollars. Yeah, we have a lottery. We just, we just had a draw the other day for a million bucks too. And we've got another one coming up. Hmm. And I actually entered the draw. <laughs> so we'll cross that bridge if I win. Yeah. I mean, maybe if they'll give me the million bucks to take the shot right there, maybe I'll consider it. I mean, that'd be a tough one, right? A million bucks cash right there. It would be a tough one. That'd be a tough call, right? That's a tougher call than a hundred bucks for sure. A hundred bucks is a no brainer, but a million bucks, dude, I'd have to think about that. Right. It's going to be a life changing vaccine one way or another. Either, either way, yeah, maybe on both ends, maybe hopefully only on one end, but so we did all that. But even at the end of the day, what we still don't have is paid sick leave. And now I'm not a proponent, say, of government intervening on that level. I'm definitely not a proponent of the government telling me or Greg that you need to pay your employees two weeks to stay home when they get sick. But hey, for all the money the government's got and it's thrown around anyway, how is that not a thing yet? How is that not our number one thing right now? Is if you're sick, stay home. I mean, we had it set up so that you could just click on your online stuff and you'd have two grand within three days or you'd have your unemployment money within three days. So we can't figure out a system there that, you know, Janet gets sick, she doesn't wanna to go to work, but Janet's also a single mom and she lives paycheck to paycheck and she gets paid hourly because this is a situation that, you know, sometimes we forget that half the world is in. But, you know, in Canada where we're, we're fairly down the road of socialism already, we got the free healthcare. I mean, you'd think you'd save healthcare money there. Just, 
you could probably save that on the back end just by taking it out of the healthcare budget, paying people to stay home when they're sick. But I think the fact that two years into COVID or whatever it is, we still don't have that in Canada. We have like all these other things, but we still won't pay you to stay home if you're sick. Mm -hmm. Unless you're quarantined and guaranteed to have COVID. So, I mean, that's the kind of the jig is up on that one, but it looks like Alberta's slipping right back into it. I mean, we'll see how harsh it is. We've been lucky in Alberta because our police here haven't enforced it at all. The Alberta RCMP from the get go basically publicly said they weren't interested in what people were doing with their private lives. So we, on the outside, it looked like we had harsh mandates here, probably some of the harshest, because I think from December until May or something like that, April or May, they basically said, you can't have anyone, you can't hang out with anyone outside and you can't hang out with anyone inside. No hanging out with anyone, period. The restaurants were closed, all that, but then they had this thing where if you were a single mom or stuff like that, you were allowed to have, if you didn't live with anyone, all of a sudden you were allowed to have a couple of cohorts. So, but I mean, I was just sort of doing whatever I wanted the whole time. We had a couple of barbecues over here and nothing ever happened. As far as I know, not a lot of that was enforced, mm -hmm. but I mean, the restaurant people took a fucking beating. Yeah. You're yeah. taking a beating again already. I mean, just closing that shit at 10 o'clock, sucks to people who want to go out and party and stuff like that but i mean there's a, just just a shitload of people that just lost their income again yeah really sad and i mean we're still at the average age in alberta of people that have died or are hospitalized because of covid as per the government website is 80 years old the average life expectancy for alberta is 81. so to shut down the entire economy because this is happening seems I don't know. I mean, I just got called a Nazi on Twitter again <laughs> because I stated that because they're having a big scare thing. I, I actually quoted on Jason Kenny's stupid little press conference tweet that, you know, the average age, someone who's hospitalized for COVID is 80 and the average life expectancy is 81. That's as far as I'm concerned that those are the only stats you need to know. I don't want old people to die. I'm not saying that's fine, but we need to look at this with some context here. How many of the people that we saved last year are still with us this year? Mm -hmm. I guess that's the ultimate question. I mean, people that we're shutting down to save aren't going to see the end of COVID anyway for other reasons. I mean, it sucks, but I mean, his quarrels with God, not with me. <laughs> right, right. For me, it's just the the biggest issue is hearing from a lot more people that are seeing the sadness catch up to them. The isolation, the uncertainty, all the stress, the splitting of friend groups and that sort of thing. And it's all right to be sad for a bit, but the only path forward that I see is building new networks, making new friends, getting out there and finding the others, as they say, you know? That's one way I guess guys like us were blessed. Yes. Because we are like, we live in the rabbit hole. So, I mean, it's mostly rabbits down here. It's not bad. You know, I mean, there's very few. If I don't go online, I don't really see it at all. There's some places at work. I have to wear a mask. Honestly, in the beginning, I kicked up a fuss about it. Now I'm just like, we're way past that hill. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right. You should get one of Sophia Smallstorm's masks because they're cheesecloth and they look like a regular mask, but you can breathe through them just fine. So... You know, if you got to wear it for multiple hours a day, I have found that to be uh, a really great tool. My wife wanted to go back to Missouri to announce that she was pregnant and uh, I wasn't going to put her on an airplane with restricted breathing. So I hit up Sophia to get one of those and she said it helped a lot. She sells them? Yeah, she makes them and she sells them. Oh, send me the link after and I'll order some of those. I have this little plastic chin thing that holds a little plastic guard out. It's a little tiny thing too. It's like, it's basically like your face mask, but it's a clear plastic thing. And there's a little thing that goes in your chin, holds it like three inches out. That works at the grocery store and all those places. I mean, people look at you funny, but like the planes and that, they're like, no, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta take that off. Right. So I definitely want to start talking about the book, but I guess the last COVID related thing I would ask you about is the vaccine and where you guys are with 
thinking about it as like, how dangerous is it really? Like, what are some of your guests saying? The people you trust, the people you think make the best case. I mean, I'm hearing people say that it's a death sentence, that in three to five years, everyone who got it will be gone. I think that's a little hyperbolic. To me, the biggest group of people is people who get COVID and are fine or people who get the vaccine and are fine. Like in either case, I think we're talking about 10% who are really going to be lifelong affected. And I don't know. I'm just, I, I tend to think that like we get hyperbolic in the alternative community. And the reality is that the vast majority of people who take childhood vaccines or this are probably still going to be fine. At least I have to tell myself that because I know too many damn people who've gotten it. But what do you think things look like with the vaccinated over the next uh, couple of years based on the people you've been talking to? I agree that, I mean, maybe they do, but I think that's a little harsh that everybody's fucked. I don't do black pill. I'm really not mm -hmm. super interested in entertaining that because I'm a magician. We're all magicians on a certain level. So you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. You got to kind of be aware, but not dwell on it. It's a scary time though, man. I mean, I know a whack of people that have got it and they're fine, like completely fine. No, nothing. People that I work with high level construction people, like the high level mm -hmm. sorts of people in it that are on the ball. You know, when you're meeting with them, they're on the ball and they're still on the ball. But I also know people close to me that are still on the ball, but they got a joint thing. Because maybe that, you know, it started with the finger was aching and now it's all your joints sometimes go on you and they're all just sort of aching and it's sort of, and these are people that maybe had some childhood, this or that, you know, maybe some autoimmune issues already. That's what I think the biggest thing is going to be. Yeah seems to be an autoimmune trigger that on the best case scenario it's the same as a childhood vaccine on some level the problem is you're taking it from four million people a year you know four to six million people a year getting the childhood vaccines to what a billion yeah it's some insane number at this point right it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions i mean even at one in ten thousand that starts to get crazy Guys like you and I know it's not one in 10,000. It's a lot higher than that. But it's not one in one, I don't think. I mean, I don't know. Do you think they'd be that? My thought is that the population problems that they're talking about are usually in the third world, not in the first world. But they have maybe they've gotten to the point where they want to replace us with People that want to listen or not, you know, I don't know. Right. But it seems like there's easier ways to do that at the same time than this whole thing. You know what I mean? Like you could have just released a real bug then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other problem is I don't know what to believe these days. Right. It's like we're in this weird new world where stuff Graham's telling me and stuff I'm hearing from the alternative community and stuff I'm, I'm hearing from podcasts and the stuff I'm seeing on the news and on the MSM. I mean, it's all just, there's so much shit on the walls now. It's pretty hard to see what's going on at this point. So it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. But my hope is that it's just like pharma greed. Yeah, yeah. I think that I also do think that they are obsessed with managing the planet and they do have in the back of their minds that they're doing something good and they have to preserve the system. And I think automation is a big thing on their minds. And so if they're thinking, oh, we can just take out 20 percent of the useless eaters. I really think that's a, a thing that they would entertain in these think tanks because they would see it as well. With automation, there's going to be so many people without jobs. And what are we going to do with all these people, these drains on the system? Let's call them a little bit. So the timing with automation does make me think that that's a little bit in the mindset. But there's a lot of, as you say, crazy things going on in the alternative community. Graphene oxide, it seems to be a component of the vaccines. And I think it's a real blessing for us that they're now going with boosters and third shots because it seems like you're never going to be fully vaccinated, as they say, with just two shots. So 
if people are all across the spectrum from zero shots to the most up-to-date recommendations, whatever they end up being, I mean, there's a lot of variance in there. And so when you start restricting rights based on who's fully vaccinated, well, now a lot of people who have two shots and me now are in the same category. And I like that. I think that that works for, for our benefit. The more people in the club, even those who've already gotten vaccinated, when they move the goalpost and people decide that they've just had it, they're not going to comply anymore. I think that's going to help us out a lot. And one of the darker, stranger things that is being talked about is technocracy and this move to push people to digital spaces that are highly controlled and make the physical body uncomfortable and make people desire to live in these digital spaces. It st- starts to sound like Ready Player One, if you've seen the movie, like everybody's in poverty and filth and they just want to get that headset on and escape to the game. That to me seems like a real possibility of where things are going. And maybe these routine shots having to continually get re-upped, I mean, Potentially, it is one of those things that pushes people to be more of a chimera, more of a a digital friendly body rather than one that's kind of in tune with the natural world and gets people further and further away from the natural space. A lot of crazy stuff being talked about, but I could see some of these things circling around the mindset of the Archon controlled elite. And I just think all you can do is uh, keep it all at bay. And as you say, we're magicians. So the mindset, it's got got to be kind of important to keep it positive. Well, I definitely think the time to like, like I said, I've given up on the mask battle. And I mean, I'm kind of at the point where like jumping up and down about not being vaccinated doesn't seem like such a hot idea anymore either. Like it's time to just shut the fuck up Mm -hmm. and fight it. You know, I'm not complying. Graham's like, well, that's compliant. I'm like, no, it's not. You know what I mean? I got my papers just in case. But, I mean, how I got them, that remains to be seen. I'm not vaccinated, but I've got papers that say I am. I mean, the problem becomes when there's three, four, five, and six of those, how do you keep up? But, I mean, then it becomes, I mean, are they pushing us to want to just give in to that digital system so that you just scan your QR code every time you get a new shot so they know who's up to date? And I mean, I guess the hope is that I'm not the hope even, but I feel like we're close to getting a wake up call on, on how fragile the whole thing is and maybe put all this into some real context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether that's something with China or something else, but it starts to look weird when you see places like Russia and China banning this thing. Right. Yes. Very curious. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird world. I mean, and to bring it back to the book, it's interesting timing in that regard too. I mean, we're, we're less than a hundred years removed from Indians needing to pass before they could leave their reserve. Right. So you've got a designated section of land that you can't leave without having a pass in your hand. This is in fucking early 1900s. Very hard to enforce, but now easy to enforce. Right. I mean, we're getting to the point where we're going to agree to have all our money on our phones and they'll just be able to say, well, this doesn't work anymore. If you're farther than this. Mm-hmm. It also doesn't work if you're not this. Right. That's the kind of thing I try to point out to conventional thinking friends all the time that eugenics is not a dead philosophy. We are not that far from a lot of the things that, you know, people think are are gone. I mean, people think they can trust these authorities. They can trust this medical system. So I try to highlight all the times that the medical system has abused people And when you hear Bill Gates saying, oh, we got to get this shot in the arms of the black and brown people first. I mean, that should be the easiest thing to see through. The biggest red flag, if you think Bill Gates, that's his priority, really? I mean, why is he getting kicked out of uh, these third world countries with his vaccine campaigns? Uh, Yeah, but we could talk about it all day. Let's let's move on and, and get into the book a bit. I guess a good place to start is really with your own history and background and why this book was an important one for you to write. Well, honestly, I was like, I didn't grow up on the reserve. I am a registered Indian from the Mishkegogaming Band, Ojibwe Nation in Ontario. Also Ojibwe, some people call Anishinaabe. So the book kind of was one of those weird things. I wasn't really 
thinking about it but i mean over the last so i grew up I grew up off reserve in Ontario. I wasn't very close. I didn't grow up with my dad in my life. So I was, I was very detached from that whole side of things. I grew up in the eighties and nineties in a mining town in Ontario where the population was probably, you know, there's still a lot of that hostile sort of, or residual racism, I guess, left over from everything that's going on and and what you have in my hometown is also a lot of homeless and for a town of five or six thousand people you'd think there's not a lot of homelessness but there's a lot of homeless natives in my hometown older on the streets drunk all the time and even myself growing up you have no idea why you know it's just like what's going on here so you get that it's just their fault and and all that sort of thing starts happening. And that causes more sort of weird trauma when you're an Indian growing up in that environment. And anyway, it wasn't until I had kids. And it's funny enough, I went through a bunch of alcoholism and stuff like that in my twenties and came out the other side of it. Luckily, not everyone does. I had my kids and I pulled out of it. And as my kids got older, it started to seem more of an important thing as I got back into hunting and stuff like that. Of course, some hunting rights come along with that. So that kind of the hunting and the fishing got me sort of facing off with conservation officers a little more over the last few years, you know, with them trying to tell me I can't fish here. Or I shouldn't be doing that. And I'm very abrasive in that sense where you know let's have that conversation and and i won most of those conversations i'm pretty good at retaining information and stuff like that so we'll kind of read through things to see where we stand and then as covid got going i started using some of those rights to travel because i've got an into the usa with the card whether i'm vaxxed or not like i'll be driving down in the states here in a couple of weeks and there's nothing. It's funny because no one else is driving to the States right now. So I get to cut into the trucker line and stuff like that. But I mean, that's kind of what got me down the road of looking at things and the current climate of how everything is going on. And then they started finding the bodies earlier this year. And you start talking to people and nobody really like none of my friends that really know anything about it. They don't know what a residential school is. And I didn't know what most of that was either five or 10 years ago. But you start learning about it and you start trying to bring it up. And there was just so many misconceptions from people that, you know, aren't racist. There are people I'm friends with, people I hang out with, people I work with, but they just, they have no idea. Because there's no education of it. There's no education of it in me growing up, you know, basically on Indian land or very close to it. The only reason it wasn't Indian land is because there was gold there. Hmm. So it was sort of taken over, but a huge Indian population there. And there's just, you know, we don't even grow up. As far as we grow up, you know, the Americans, they had their wars with the Indians bad. We all became friends up here. It was all, it was all fine. <laughs> yes, that is the conventional kind of thought. Yeah. So, it kind of hit in June that it was like, okay, well, all this information is there. It's all publicly available. I mean, really, the book is probably 80% or 85% isn't written by me. It's public domain information, whether it's old reports, excerpts from the government website, stuff from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place from from 2008 to 2015, they generated just thousands of pages of reports that, so all this information is there. It's all readily available. But what I noticed over the last few years is even when I want to look for it, it's hard to find. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you're not just punch it into Google and here's ding, 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 ding. And then the thing that really triggered me was when I went on this year and I went to start looking for the old versions of the Indian Act, which originally came into place in 1876. And you go on the Government of Canada website and it does not exist. The earliest rendition of the Indian Act that you can find on the Canadian government website is 1985 currently. There might be a 1951 hidden there somewhere, but if there is, I haven't been able to find it. The only place I've been able to find anything pre-1985 is actually on 
First Nations websites. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's 650 bands in Canada and a few of them have decent websites. Some of them have worse websites. Some of them don't have websites at all, but some of the ones that have a bigger web presence have got, you know, all of these acts in their entirety and PDF and stuff like that. So, I mean, that not being there was a big thing for me and it took me a while. I actually didn't find the PDF on some of these other websites until I was well down the road of researching the book. So all I could find for the Indian Act, the original Indian Act, when I first started looking earlier this year was an old scanned PDF version that you could barely read. It's like scanned out of the original book. So I paid a guy in India to retype the whole thing, like 500 bucks to retype the whole thing into like a readable format that could be made into a, a real PDF so that I could make it available online and so that I could have it for my own purposes for writing the book and stuff like that. And it was actually, I was going to release that whole Indian Act, the original 1967 and all the amendments and everything. It was like 485 pages, eight and a half by 11 or something like that. <laughs> And I was just going to release that as sort of a not-for-profit thing. So it was out there. And then what I was writing was originally just, I was going to write a two or three page little blurb for the front of that before I could release it, kind of explaining what I had done and blah, blah, blah. And, and just in writing the blurb, it kind of extended to six pages and then seven pages. And then I was like, well, no one wants to read. When, when I shrink this down to to six by nine, it's like fucking closing in on a thousand pages. Hmm. So, you know, nobody's going to read that. I mean, even 400 pages is a stretch, right? Like, I don't want to read 400 pages of super dry material. Right. So I was like, well, maybe I should just sort of highlight some of this. And my original goal was to get something I was thinking around 100 to 120 pages, something super small super concise where we get where it's not going to scare people off they could sort of get through it on a plane ride so that's sort of where the book came from and that's how it got put together as mostly an amalgamation of information from all over the place so there's nothing in there that i am speculating there's mm -hmm. no speculation in here it's all i would say the closest thing to speculation which i would argue is not speculation at all is the International Tribunal for the Disappeared of Canada. But I mean, if you go to, and it's all linked in the book, but if you go to his website, I mean, he's got 120 pages at the back of his digital book that have the old newspaper clippings and all of that stuff. So it's basically just a source and it's 10% of the book almost is the bibliography. I mean, that was probably the worst part of it is me and my girlfriend going through and trying to source all of it. Right, right. We sourced it all down to the pages of the parliaments and any place we could, we took it back to original, not just to some other site on the internet. No, here's where he said this in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. And to give people some context for what is in that Indian Act of 1876, this is when they extinguished any indigenous self-governing structures and really started to manage the native people. And you say in the book, here are just a few of the sections of the Indian Act or policies that were particularly oppressive and destructive to the people and their culture. The ban of religious ceremonies, the ban of Indians leaving reservations without Indian agent permission, inability to vote, introduction of mandatory residential schools, which we'll get into, the denial of status of Indian women, Creation of reserves, prohibition of alcohol sales, prohibition of the sale of ammunition, prohibition of solicitation of funds for Indian legal claims. I mean, that's a huge one. And these are just a few of the atrocities hidden within the Indian Act over its century and a half long existence. A document that is still legally binding at the time of this writing, as you say. They've rewritten certain parts of it made it less offensive in some areas, but it is still the law of the land, technically, it seems. Technically, in a lot of ways. And I mean, you might get some flack for us using the word Indian on here. I mean, I call myself an Indian. Right. I'll try and use indigenous or native or first nations where I can, but personally, 
I refer to myself as an Indian. The reason being is because I have a little card. I don't have my wallet on me, but I have a little card in my wallet that says I'm a registered Indian. And that's the exact wording on it. I'm a registered Indian. I have a registration number because of my DNA. Now, I think they've sort of changed the name of the, it used to be the Indian Affairs Canada. Now they've maybe changed that to Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you can go to the Canadian website right now. It's still called the Indian Act. I'm still a registered Indian. There's a whole page of definitions that I just copy pasted from the Canadian website into the book that still uses the term Indian, competent Indian, registered Indian, legal Indian. All of those terms are still very much in play by the Canadian government and I assume the U.S. government as well. So as far as I'm concerned, let's not play games. I mean, let's not virtue signal that we're using terms like native and indigenous until the fucking government. I mean, it's not that hard. It shouldn't be that hard to change that kind of stuff if we cared enough. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that virtue signaling and stuff like that actually does the exact opposite and makes people think that it's fine. But, you know, it makes people think that we're all using the term indigenous while I'm still walking around with a card in my wallet that says registered India. Right. Right. Great points. Great points. And I mean, another big one on the reserves, it is another misconception people get, especially in the Canadian system. I don't know how the American system works. My, uh, my book's very much on the Canadian system, but no Indian land is owned by Indians in Canada. It's all held in trust by the federal government for registered Indians. So basically the context being there is once we all assimilate, which I think we're down to about a half a million actual registered Indians in Canada, there's about 1.6 or 1.7 million non-registered, Métis, Inuit, and all that. But there's, we're down to around just over half a million registered Indians. The plan would, of course, be, I mean, me, I'm, I'm an example of assimilated, right? I live in a town. I work a full-time job. I pay my taxes. I start a business. I don't live on the reserve at all. I use some of my stuff. I get use my hunting rights and stuff like that. But for all intents and purposes, I've assimilated into the Canadian system. Now, what's going to happen is once that all happens, that land's all going to go back to the crown. So at the end of the day, the Indians don't have any land, which is a huge misconception in Canada. And the other thing is now is people worry about, well, if we're coming for land, whose land are we going to take, right? Am I going to lose my land? If the Ojibwe needs some land, is that going to come out of Jim's ranch? And it doesn't need to. It doesn't fucking close to need to, because if you look at a country like Canada, we're sitting at 88.9% of all the land in Canada is owned by the government. Either the provincial government or the federal government owns 88.9% of all the land in Canada, and over half of the remaining is owned by corporations. Wild. So, I mean, I think we can find something in the 19 out of 20 parts so that we don't have to cut into the one of 20. And I think, you know, everyone's private land can be fine. We can find a way to make this all work. I mean, at this point, I don't even think you need any more land. I don't know what it looks like. I mean, let's be honest. I'm a pothead like you, and I'm not saying that in a bad way, but who's just putting the information out there. I don't have the answers on how we get out of the Indian Act. I'm just trying to start that conversation because I shouldn't have the answers. It's not up to me. It's up to 650 different First Nations in Canada. But until we sit down around a table with those representatives, or maybe they each region can figure out a representative or some way to do this. But until we get around the table and start having a conversation about how we're going to get out of this Indian Act and move on to something different. But at this point, we could probably work something out that doesn't cost a whole lot more land than you've got already. Maybe a little bit more. We can figure out some more here and there. And let's just start actually passing that over you know and then maybe we can pay taxes on it or something i don't know i'm not against that i pay taxes now but the way it's set up now it just doesn't work it's not getting better for anybody and it's not getting better for for the people on the reserve and it's not getting better for the government and it's just this problem that's not going away we still have a problem where you know half the reserves in canada have to boil their water damn and it's just like, you know, we're still sending out billions and billions and we got a billion dollars to bribe the provinces. I'm just paraphrasing the half. It might not be there, but it's hundreds. There's hundreds of reserves in Canada that have to boil their water. 
but we got billions of dollars to send overseas. We got a billion dollars to bribe fucking people with the provinces with right now to get COVID to implement a vaccine passport system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of a scary thing. That's a scary thing to me. And my running joke with Graham lately is that, you know, you guys are all the Indian now and it's going to be the reserves going to be the city and it's going to be, you don't leave. And the funny thing is when you drive around here in Alberta, you'll get like, you know, an hour and a half Southwest of the city. And it'll be like 714th Avenue Southwest. And it's like, why, you know, the city's never going to get here in 50 years, but you could almost see where they could just quadrant that all off into municipality sections instead of, I mean, it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. And that is a time when I'm sort of happier to be in Canada especially in Alberta, just for the reason that like my state comment is there's only 20,000. There's only 20,000 standing military in Canada, 20,000 hmm. might be like 23 or something like that. But I'd rather that than, you know, what Israel's up against or what you guys could be up against, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know, in that sense, I feel like it'll be much harder. I, now I'm on my way out of town right now. I'm currently actively looking for, you know, a five or 10 acre parcel or so someplace an hour away from the city. So I can have, you know, I'm not under the illusions that it's foolproof, but I feel like it's much better, Yeah, you know, because it does seem like at least for the next few years to a decade, it's going to be confined to the, to at least the some sort of city level. I mean, you can get the towns to enforce it too, fine. But I mean, nobody's driving by my ranch in the middle of nowhere. I mean, maybe they'll start tracking the phones and stuff. I don't know. But then you just, I mean, it wouldn't be the worst if we left our phones at home and we had a barbecue anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think the management class, they just cast big nets and they get as many people as they can. And I don't think they worry too much about those on the periphery. They're not trying to get every single body because I just don't think you can. They're trying to use the mass media and everything they can to create the perception that it's every single person. But if you shut that stuff off, if you put a little distance between you and the machine, I think you'll be all right. And let's get into the residential schools. This is the darkest of the dark, man. I mean, we've often heard that Schools are the one of the first things that an invading empire sets up so that they can convert the kids to the new way of life, separate them from their parents and their culture, and teach them the new Western ways. But these schools in Canada seemed particularly brutal. You write that as of 1884, attendance in residential schools became mandatory for Indians until the age of 16. Children are forcibly removed and separated from their families and not allowed to speak their own language or practice their own religious rituals. And I've heard you talk about this in other interviews that sometimes kids came home for the summer, sometimes they didn't. But I mean, when you're young and you go eight months without speaking your native tongue and you're being taught French or English, and then you come back to your parents who don't know a lick of that. Now you've created this divide within the family, and it's really, really sad. And that's just one aspect of these schools and how terrible they were. But what else would you say for people who are unfamiliar? Well, I mean, you can add to that that they were taught that their parents speaking that language is because they were lesser, hmm. because they were devils, because of being indoctrinated with Christianity at the same time or Catholicism or whatever the case may be, but it's basically, so, I mean, and you can read through, I mean, the truth and reconciliation documents have hundreds of interviews with survivors where they talk about just that, where they'd go home after a year because they maybe they got thrown on a farm, which would happen a lot. You'd go and maybe learn, we'd call it like an apprenticeship today, but it's much darker than that, of course. So you wouldn't get home for maybe over a year, maybe two years at a young age. But like you said, even even one year, what was happening is when these kids were going home, they, they couldn't communicate anymore. Right. They could no longer communicate with their parents. Their parents couldn't communicate with them because their parents couldn't speak English and French. 
And then they also had it in the back of their head that everything their parents was doing was sort of evil, bad, you know, not good at, at the very least. Right. Primitive at a minimum. Yeah, exactly. And then at the same time, you've sort of banned the religious ceremonies. You've banned the potlucks. You've banned this system of interweaving bands and tribes that have been sort of meeting up over the years. And it's even though you had one band, say, of a couple hundred or a thousand thousand natives and you'd put them on on one reserve, I mean, that they're used to meeting up a few times a year and there's this whole intermingling thing. So, I mean, all that's taken away at the same time. But and at the same time, you're in the school where your teachers are punishing you every time you speak your own language. If you've got a sibling, you know, you're sort of not allowed to talk to them. You're kept away from them. And you go home if you're lucky and you can't communicate with your family anymore and you think everything they do is primitive and you're at the best and at the worst, you just can't communicate with them. And in the back of your head, you think your parents have just taken you to this place and left you there, which, I mean, if everyone just takes a minute and just thinks about your kids, if you just, when they turn six, if you just took them off and dropped them off at an institution and didn't see them for a few years. I mean, none of us are going to be okay with that today, but that was happening up until, you know, 60 years ago in Canada. Right. Right. And of course, the big story that's coming out now are these mass unmarked graves of children around these schools. From the book, I wrote down 215 bodies at Camp Loops Indian Residential School, 109 bodies at the Brandon Indian Residential School, 751 bodies at the Maryvall Indian Residential School. And these are just three examples. There are quite a few more, right? Yeah, I think the last time I checked, it was up to over 5,000. Wow, total kids in unmarked graves. Yeah, mostly kids. And I think, you know, there's the argument that a lot of those graves used to be marked, and I've got a lot of time for that. I don't think they were all crammed in unmarked graves. They were probably put in marked graves and it's been 60, 70 years of just people not giving a fuck or not paying attention or, you know, they got knocked over or they rotted or maybe they were unmarked, but it's a disaster. And the funny thing is that not the funny thing, but guys like Kevin and Nett that have been saying this for 20 years, I mean, their numbers are closer to 10 times this. Mm. And he's got real concerns that the only reason this is coming out now is because they're sort of ready for it. This is a controlled release of we'll give them five or 10,000 and we'll just leave the rest to be done with it. Right. Limited hangout, classic situation. And let's talk about how these kids died. I mean, a lot of it apparently is tuberculosis. A 1907 report said that in one case, over 25% of the 1,537 students had died from tuberculosis, with some schools approaching 70% death rates. Bryce's report blamed school construction and care standards for the much higher rates of tuberculosis in the schools, which went against the popular racial susceptibility theory of the time. And uh, we also have a race racial susceptibility thread to COVID too. And I just think this is so important to bring this stuff up to people who think this mindset is gone, that the elite are no longer racist, that we can trust them. They have our best interests at heart. It's a tale as old as time that they don't. But talk to us about tuberculosis in these schools. Cause my first thought was always that when you find these mass graves, it's abuse, it's murdering kids and just uh, not taking care of them, which, you know, of course, Disease, I think we both kind of rethought what disease is and how it affects us and its relationship to standards of, of cleanliness and, and health. Talk to us about tuberculosis and how you're processing the fact that the majority of these deaths seem to be because of that. I mean, the main thing was probably that it was about a six or seven to one between indigenous kids at schools and indigenous kids on the reserve so i mean tuberculosis was a big problem already i mean there probably was a bit of i mean if disease works like that which i we don't know i mean we still that's probably still on the table but if there was uh 
it seems to me to be more of a poverty thing again, where the poorer you were, the more chance you had of dying of tuberculosis. Because even the on-reservation numbers compared to the general population of the settler population was still higher. But once you got onto the residential schools, it was about seven times the settler population, I think about four times the on-reserve population. And I mean, I think that still just boils down to cramming a bunch of kids into a shitty house in a Canadian winter. I mean, no one really cares. You know, so you got it. You're coming to a thing where there wasn't a lot of love in these places. You got kids that aren't getting hugged. They're not getting touched. When they're sick, they're probably just left in their bed alone. They're probably not getting extra care when they're sick. They're probably not being separated from the population. And it's one less mouth to feed, probably is the outlook of the time. And then there's a ton of reports from Bryce's own report, who was the, I forget his exact title at the time, but he was put in charge of checking the health level of these places out by the government. Now, when he started questioning the government and wrote his report, he was forced into retirement. He fought that and tried to overturn it. And he was unsuccessful and was forced into retirement, which is why he released it as a book. The book was a national crime, which is where a lot of this information can be found now. It's only about a little 22 page book, but it's basically just a breakdown of exactly what was happening in these schools and why tuberculosis was such a problem. I mean, the other problem is there was a ton of abuse. I mean, let's be honest, Catholics in the fucking 1800s and the early 1900s weren't great to fucking any kids. You know, it's mm-hmm. a harsh fucking thing. And now, take it on to a bunch of savages quote unquote that you're not happy about where you are or why you are or your post and you're just stuck there with a bunch of kids you don't like so there's a ton of stories of abuse i'm sure a ton of murder there's a ton of stories of principles and because it seemed like the principles in a lot of time ended up with the authority in these situations but there's a ton of evidence of of just that abuse murder that kind of stuff And the other big one is running away. I mean, a ton of these kids took it on themselves to try and run away. Some ended up getting caught. Some gave up and came back. Some made it. But we're talking about Canada. There's a lot of untamed wilderness now in 2021. A hundred years ago, it was much, much more untamed. And, you know, the weather is harsh six months of the year. So for a young kid to be walking around or wandering around in the fall, the spring or the winter, which you really wouldn't know any better at that age, and you just want to get away and you end up just uh, succumbing to the the elements. I think, you know, their official numbers, they say it's up to 6,000 kids died at the schools. I think that number is probably closer to 60. Mm -hmm. I can't say that in the book, though, because I don't speculate. But that's my personal thought, is that that number is probably closer to 50 or 60,000 kids. Fair enough. And I have this quote from Scott. I can't remember his first name, but he's one of the players, you say, who's involved with all this. But his quote from 1910 says, I can safely say that barely half of the children in our Indian schools survive to take advantage of the education we are offering them. I mean, that's pretty dark, but it's right from the horse's mouth right there. And that's 18. That's to 18 he's talking about. We're not even taking into account what happened to these kids in early adulthood. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you start taking into account how many of them ended up with alcoholism problems, how many of them ended up with crime problems, I mean, you've completely broken a person when you've done this to them at that age. And if they're lucky enough to get through that, now, you know, you've got a huge percentage with drinking problems. You've got an insane increase in suicide among Indigenous and Inuit populations in Canada, especially young people right up to today. So we've got three generations of You know, we're just kind of getting a grasp on where Indians are raising their own kids again. I mean, so for like 100 years, I mean, technically is is 1884 maybe or 1894. I should get those years right. 
because it was up until 1947 that it was mandatory attendance and i believe it started in 18 yeah 1884 to 1947 mandatory attendance so i mean we're 60 years removed from that so maybe two generations but so you got to think now the repercussions of that are that maybe you're the first generation of parents that are raising their own kids now is into the 60s but these people weren't raised by parents they didn't learn i mean parenting's hard enough right i mean as you're about to find out (laughs) i already know but i mean it's hard enough with all the information and everything we've got around us today but now take into that that you never got to experience the child end of that Mm-hmm. because that's the biggest one, right? That's the biggest thing we ever learn from is from watching our parents. Now you take that away, that these kids didn't have that. They didn't have a parents to emulate. They didn't have parents to copy. They didn't really have parents to love. They didn't have really have anyone to love. But then they stumbled out of that somehow, had kids, and now got to figure out something that, you know, arguably 30% of the population has an insane problem with today and not letting it slip into addiction or abuse. Today, we're talking 20 or 30% of people in modern society living the way we live can't keep a lid on that shit. Now, add to that that you were basically in a concentration camp for your developing years and you never got raised by parents. How high does that number go up then? Oh. Man, it is wild. And I also wanted to ask you about some of your upcoming trips. You guys really are doing what needs to be done, strengthening the tribe, building out the network, and just having a good time out in the world. I am a little jealous. I do still plan on coming to Magic on the Mountain in February, if you guys will have me, and my life is calmed down a little bit by then. But I know you got a lot of other trips on the books, too. Tell people about them. Well, I'm actually headed down in two weeks. Two weeks from Monday, I'm driving back down to Washington State to Soap Lake, Washington to meet up with Randall Carlson and friends. And the Brothers of the Serpent are going to be there. Ben from Uncharted X will be there. And Brandon Powell, the Wim Hof trainer, is going to be there. And we're going to be doing Wim Hof training there, doing some cold water training, doing the breath work. And of course, we're going to be cruising around for six days looking at all the channeled scab lines with Randall Carlson. We'll be doing some presentations at night. I was lucky enough to just do this tour. This is our second one this year. We did another one in May from the 3rd to the 8th. It was a fantastic time. I'm looking forward to get back down there. We had, I think, about 15% rebuy of the people that came on the first tour wanted to come back and do it all over again. So they're doing that. We are sold out for that, but we'll be doing that from the 20th to the 26th. Having a good old time. Usually Randall on the last night does his fabled moon presentation, which is a getter. Ah, I highly yes. recommend it. <laughs> so we got that September 20th to 26th. That's the last one of the year. We pulled off three this year. Even during the lockdowns in Canada, we managed to, Graham couldn't get out, but I got out and we were able to pull those off. Of course, we have the magic on the mountain in Arizona that you mentioned in February. That'll be February 10th to 13th in Lakeside, Pine Top Lakeside, Arizona. I'll probably have to drive down, I think, with the new vacuum and stuff, but that's okay. Arizona's a nice drive. That's got to be like 20 some hours. Right. If you can go 27 hours, I can go five. There you go. I mean, I've driven to California a couple of times, Colorado. I'm used to it. It's still better than jumping through their hoops, but we're doing that in Arizona from the 10th to the 13th. We've got for sure Joe Roop's going to be there, Owen Hunt, Brandon Powell. We'll have some actual snow up there, so we'll do some proper Wim Hofen up there, and we're going to learn a bunch of magic and manifestation tricks to take on life. We'll do a day trip over to the Petrified Forest National Park for anyone who wants to go. And then next April, April 28th to May 2nd, we're in Utah for Contact at the Canyons. We go with our mutual friend Dave Matheson and yeah. Brandon Powell. We meet up down in southwestern Utah on duck creek mountain and we hang out we go to bryce canyon hike it have dinner out in the park there and then we wait till dark and we check out the stars the stars at bryce canyon are amazing and we have 
our buddy Dave there telling us all the star mythology and pointing out all the constellations and all that. It really is a good time. It's great for couples. Unfortunately, that sold out. If you do decide to come to that one, though, I will get you in. All right. That's probably my favorite one. Honestly, it's the four days just hanging out and hiking and checking out the stars. And we got a giant chalet rented out up there in Duck Creek. We're there right before the start of the season up there. So it's super quiet. And you get to fly into Vegas on your way in. So, I mean, you get, if you want, you can have a night in Vegas and then head up on the mountain to decompress. I'll tell you, that's a crazy drive. I bought a bag of chips just outside of Vegas on my way up the mountain. And we we're driving up the mountain and you hear a pop. And I was like, what the hell was that? Then sure enough, all the chips have exploded in the back seat. I've never seen anything like that, but it was pretty gnarly. But that, that one sold out too. We're thinking about doing a second week. And then, of course, next June, we're doing the second half of the Scablands tour in Idaho and Montana with Randall Carlson again. That's already half sold. And next November, we're going to Egypt. Damn. Two weeks in Egypt with Ben from Uncharted X and the Snake Brothers. Right. Got That's it. all over at contactatthecabin.com. If people want to check that out, they can join the mailing list or get on a wait list. We have some wait lists because lately, the, you know, the world's pretty fluid these days with people wanting to travel or being able to travel. So there's always some last minute movement. If you get your name on a wait list, sometimes you can get in last minute. Mm hmm Wow. Well, ambitious and bold, and uh, I love it. I love it. I'm definitely a little jealous, but I'm going to try to make it out on some of these trips. I got to quit just talking about it and actually get out of the my little bubble here in San Diego. I just don't leave it. And Once you get out once, you'll just be like, oh, this is great. Right. It's dumb to keep complaining about the same things and then doing the same things and not actually making some kind of change. So it just, uh, unfortunately, it coincides right with having my first kid. So it's like, now's not the time to start getting out, <laughs> but maybe it is. I don't know. But is there anything else we should tell the people before I cut you loose? Where to get the book? Obviously, where to get the show? I'm sure most people are aware, but still, it's how these things tend to wind down. Yeah. Well, of course, the website's grimerica.ca. You can find everything from there. That'll lead you sort of everywhere. GrimericaOutlaw.ca is the other podcast. The book, A Canadian Shame, is available on Amazon, every place else. Or you can go to a CanadianShame.ca. There's a little contact form at the bottom if you need bulk copies or if you want a signed copy or anything like that. I can do that for you. And then the other big thing we got going these days is the audiobooks. We've taken a bunch of these esoteric classics turn them into audio as narrated by Graham Dunlop, co-host of Grimerica does the reading, I do the editing. But we've got, I think, about 20 titles available now. And you can go to adultbrain.ca. That'll give you a list of them all. Or if you go to like Audible or iTunes and just type in Graham Dunlop or Grimerica, they should all pop up as well. That includes my book, A Canadian Shame, is available on audio. Same with The Secret Teachings of All Ages we did. That's about 35 hours by Manly P. Hall. We've done all three of Blavatsky's Secret Doctrines, Secret Doctrine 1, 2, and 3. Again, they're about 35 hours each. Hamlet's Mill, which is a big one that comes up a whole ton in these esoteric circles, wasn't available as an audiobook. We finally made that available as an audiobook. The Unabomber Manifesto, we've got that up there. And just basically, we're going through all these books written in the 1800s that you know, you'll probably never read, but if you could just listen to someone else read it, you might do it. I mean, I'm never going to read The Secret Doctrine, but it's not so bad to listen to it read to me. <laughs> I like it. That is awesome. Really making uh, a mark on the world, you guys are. And trying. To. Very cool. <laughs> yes. As are you. Sometimes. But congrats on getting a book done. I know it's not easy. It takes a lot of discipline to say the least. And you're highlighting an important issue that deserves the attention. And great talking to you again, man. Take care out there. Anytime, Greg. Love to be here. Yes, people. My Canadian podcasting colleague from the North getting his first book out. Passing me by in so many ways. I kid, I kid. But it is a great accomplishment and an important subject that he seems uniquely situated to cover. 
It's a perfect storm of heritage and an understanding of how Empire and its cover-ups typically work through all this conspiratorial exploration for several years and the reach and network that he's built up from doing the show. And I'm glad he chose something so specific and not often highlighted, much better than throwing together a pandemic book, as a lot of people are choosing to do in the middle of the story. And I don't know if anyone noticed my stupid mistake, but when I was talking to Darren about his recent shows, I mentioned the one he did with Kay Rubicek, And for some reason, even though the topic read CCP, I read CPS and went on a little rant about the very unrelated Child Protective Services, and he didn't even call me out on it. What a guy. (laughs) But I'm glad we could highlight this scandal and contribute to its ongoing exposure. I'm sure many of us have heard the headlines about these mass graves in Canada, but not a lot else. So this was informative. And I'm sure you can hear it in my voice every time I talk to Darren or Graham about how badly I wish I had a co-host. It's more in my nature to want to work with friends than to work alone. And anyone who's been with the Higher Side Chat since the early days knows that I tried. But if you feel like you're doing 80% of the work, eventually you just say, well, I suppose I can do 100% since no one really seems to care enough to read the guest's book or prepare some questions in advance. Eventually, you just say, well, this is work, and we don't often get everything we want with work, so (laughs) just do it. I probably would have been working at GameStop a year or two longer if I had to share the wealth anyway. But yes, the rotating co-hosts went away about as quickly as they came for THC, but the universe tends to unfold as it should, they say. And recording this episode with Darren is at least partly the catalyst for me finally saying fuck it and doing a real-world meetup, happening tonight, actually, Sunday, September 19th, at the Tipsy Crow in San Diego. Could be two people there, could be 20. I have no idea how many locals would be included in the larger THC audience, and I don't know how hungry people are for any kind of meat space meetup either. But I'm excited for it. I guess what has always kept me cloistered away is the few bad interactions that I've had. 99 people out of 100 just want to say, hey, love the show, keep it up, thanks for doing it, and would be a pleasure to meet in person. But then there's that one guy sending you creepy pictures and saying he's performing rituals to ruin your marriage and win your heart. You don't want to share a beer with that guy. Although if he's good at magic, maybe eventually you do. But sometimes that all keeps you from sharing a beer with anybody. Even getting friendly with guests has been a mixed bag. I probably don't even have to go into that too much for people to come up with at least one big example of what I'm talking about. I guess I just thought, well, if I keep my head down and just do the show and keep it professional with people rather than personal, what can go wrong? And nothing has gone wrong. But another question is, what might I be missing by doing that? What could go right? And the times have changed, the culture has changed, and I'm sure a lot of our priorities have changed as well. So let's step into the unknown and see how it goes. Besides, it seems like I'm going to have Alex Sakaris and Sophia Smallstorm there to keep me company. But I guess I won't really know till I'm there. And hopefully we will have more. Hopefully I can set up a calendar type system where people can host their own meetups across the country and find the others and maybe I show up to those once in a while. So don't feel like you're missing out. Either way, big thanks to Darren. Of course, you know how it goes around here. First hour of the show is free, second hour is for the supporters. And we added a lot to the stack in the second hour today. Talked about Graham's new show, The Indian in the Room talked about his thoughts on the spiritual and religious rituals and beliefs that were lost, the intentionally introducing disease aspect of these sorts of things, the 60s scoop, the missing and murdered indigenous women of Canada, and a little shooting the shit about podcasting. A fun and educational time. Sign up for Plus if you like what I do and want twice as much of it, as well as this huge archive of second hours that you've missed, and a big thanks to those who are already Plus members. Couldn't do it without you. 
I wanted to get one more show out before the meetup, so I'm glad I did, but I am gonna get out of here. I got somewhere to be for once, and I've done my part. Your move, Canadian cover-uppers, scandal suppressors, and agents of the Empire. Your fucking move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on blast. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. We're looking for the answer to questions never asked. So we come to the Carwood for the higher side chats. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. We try to get a glance. We're working on the numbers. Resistance must advance. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. <laughs>